Remember, I got to read those names in front of everybody. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Nehemiah chapter 7, and we'll pick up in verse 3 today. Um, I, I should have thought about the, um, the message, uh, the name of today's message. I would love to change that publicly now. Um, considering we're having a vote Wednesday night and we're fasting, and I, I would love to see 100% unity in our church. You hear what I'm saying there? Like, we want to be 100% unified as a church. I don't, I don't want one person left behind. I don't want one per person feeling left out. And then I went and titled the, today's sermon, You're Either In or You're Out. It has nothing to do with Wednesday, okay? It is, it is, not, it is a totally different message than Wednesday. Okay, um, <clears throat> but speaking of meetings, I hate them. I hate, those of you who've been in Salt and Light long enough, how much do I hate business meetings? I, I hate business meetings. I hate all things business side of, well, a lot of things, but, but specifically church. I just do not like church business meetings. I hate bylaws. I hate Robert's rule of order. I don't like any of it. It all bugs me. And uh, when we first started the church, I was just like, we're not having meetings. Like, that's where all the problems happen. That's true. That's where the problems start. Uh, so I'm like, I don't, I, we're just not going to have them. And then the church started to grow a little, you know, and we had 20 people and put, you know, I think we had probably a budget of like $30,000 for the whole year. And then people are saying, Hey, what are you doing with the money when we get it? And how are we handling that? And we were like, we're just operating. And people didn't really like that as an answer. So, so we started having some meetings and trying to decide things in a better way. And this old guy comes and, and he was just bent on m minutes, keeping the minutes for the meeting. And I was like, keeping the minutes, what does that mean? Like, I try to keep them short, you know, <laughs> less minutes. And, and he's like, no, you know, it's like the record. You got to keep a record of, of what you're saying. Like, how do people know what you, what you do and what you don't do? I'm like, if we have it, we voted on it. If we don't have it, we didn't. Like, it seems simple, but no. We, he said, we really needed to be keeping minutes. And I was like, look, you want to keep minutes, you keep minutes. And so he did. He started keeping the minutes. He's like, well, what's your procedure? What would the procedure be to keep minutes? I'm like, you're the one starting this, this whole thing. What, I don't know. He's like, well, what do your bylaws say? And I'm like, eh, about those. <laughs> it had been two years, and I didn't write any bylaws, and this guy was on me for a whole year. And so I finally did. I sat down in my basement, and I started writing the bylaws to the church. And we were getting calling other churches and asking them, like, how did, I mean, we're a church of 20 people. I just really felt like this was redundant and, and unneeded, and I just hated it. And uh, that was in the, in the third year we were open. So fast forward with me to year seven, and you've heard part of this story. Then the seventh year we were open, Ballardsville Baptist Church called me in January and said, hey, do you guys, would you all want to move? And they gifted us this building. They said that they would give this building to us. You can have it. And they were going to title it in our name. It's our, when I say it's ours, I don't just mean we get to use it. Like, it's ours. They titled it in our name. They said, the only thing we want is that you need to pay closing costs. That's the only cost you'll have in it is just the cost of whatever cost you move, and you pay the closing costs. How could we turn that down, right? Great. We'll, we'll do that. So I went and found a closing attorney, and I sat as she was right next door to our business. And there's a whole bunch of cool stories there you should ask me about. We'll get together sometime. I'll tell you them. There's a whole bunch of what some people would call coincidences. I think God was just opening up doors for us. And, and so I sat down with this closing attorney, and, and she said, oh, yeah, this will be, be a pretty easy deal. Uh, we just need to prove that you're a, a church, that you're, you know, not just some guy, uh, you know, that's claiming he's a church to try to avoid taxes or whatever. And I'm like, well, and, I, and by the way, I didn't just tell that first part of the story. Remember, this is for me. This is, you know, they're offering us a building. I'm sitting there at this attorney's office. She said, we got to prove you're a church. I said, how in the world do I do that? How do you want me to prove we're a church? And she goes, it's easy. I just need a copy of your bylaws and a couple of your meeting minutes, and you'll be good to go. She's like, I promise you, these words came out of her mouth. She said, you do keep minutes, right? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> what idiot wouldn't keep meeting minutes? It's funny because as much as I hated meeting minutes and still do, like my opinion about keeping minutes and voting on those minutes is, is still I'm annoyed at every time we do it. But I will tell you, that it was a good thing. God had really said, I don't think God cares about minutes or not. I don't think God cares about meetings. And I don't think that he cares in that way. But I think God was setting us up. He knew what we would need seven years after being open and God was setting us up. And that's exactly what God's done with our own lives. God sets us up for the thing that he knows we need, even though we don't really re recognize that we need it yet. We, we tend to think, we get our thoughts in a different way and we think we need something, but God says, no, this is what you need and I'm gonna prepare you for that. And I wanna show you that from this list, this, this list of genealogy, this, uh, this list of names that's in Nehemiah chapter seven. So did I give you enough time to find it? Whew, all right, I'm, 
Y'all look at these names, you're worried. I'm worried too. I got to read them publicly. So you can say amen a little bit better. I'm going to say, do you have it? And you're going to say amen nice and loud. So I don't feel like I'm struggling too much. So do you have Nehemiah 7, 3? That's better. And I said to them, do not let the gates of Jerusalem be opened until the sun is hot. And while they stand guard, let them shut the bar and the door. Uh, Let them shut and bar the door. And appoint guards from among the inhabitants of Jerusalem, one at his watch station and another in front of his own house. And now the city was large. It was spacious. But the people in it were few. And the houses were not rebuilt. And then God put it into my heart to gather the nobles and the rulers, the people, that they might be registered by genealogy. And I found a register of the genealogy of those who had come up in the first return, and found written in it. These are the people of the province who came back from the captivity, of those who had been carried away, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away, and who returned to Jerusalem and Judah, everyone to his city. Those who came with Zerubbabel were Joshua, and Nehemiah, Azariah, Ramah, Nehemiah, Mordecai, Bilshan, Mizparath, Bigvay, Nehum and uh, Nahum and, and Bana, the number of the men of the people of Israel, the sons of Parosh, 2,172, and the sons of Sarah, Sarah Patea, 3, 372, and the sons of Ara, 652. And I think you're getting the idea. I don't have to sit here and try to do this, right? I don't have to read all these. Somebody say amen. I don't have to read all these. Whew, good. <laughs> Y'all like, no, please don't. Look, that goes on and on. That list of names goes on. I'm going to skip a few. Don't accuse me. I'm not trying to do a disservice to the word, but you're going to fall asleep and I'm going to get tongue tied. Skip forward to verse 61. Look at this in verse 61. And these were the ones who came up from Tel Mela, Tel Harsha, Cherub, Adon, and Imar. Read this. But they could not identify their father's house nor their lineage whether they were of Israel. The sons of Delaya, the sons of Tobiah, the sons of Nakoda, 642. And of the priests of the sons of Habia and the, and the sons of Cuz and the sons of, uh, the sons of uh, Barzillai, who took a wife of the daughter of Barzillai, the Giladite, who was called by their name. These sought their listing among those who were registered by genealogy, but it was not found. Therefore, they were excluded from the priesthood as defiled. And the governor said to them that they should not eat of the most holy things until the priest could consult with the Urim and the Thummim. Altogether, the whole assembly was 42,360, besides their male and female servants, of whom there were 7,337. And they had 245 men and women singers. Their horses were 736, their mules 245, their camels 435, and their donkeys 6,720. And some of the heads of the father's houses gave to the work. The governor gave to the treasury 1,000 gold drachmas, 50 basins, and 530 priestly garments. Some of the heads of the father's houses gave to the treasury of the work 20,000 gold drachmas and 2,200 silver minas. And that which the rest of the people gave was 20,000 gold drachmas and uh, 2,000 silver minas and 67 priestly garments. And so the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, and the singers, and some of the people, the Nethanim, and and all Israel dwelt in their cities. And when the seventh month came, the children of Israel were in their cities. Let's go to the Lord in prayer about this. Heavenly Father, we we need you. Father, every hour we we need you. And in this moment right now, Father, we we need you. Father, we want to hear from you. We've come today. We want to encounter you. We want to hear from you. Father, we want to be drawn closer to you through your son, Jesus, and we pray that your word would do that. And Father, forgive us where we look at a list of names and think that it is meaningless. Father, we don't just want to find the meaning. Lord, we want to be challenged by you. Would you speak in this place today? Would you speak to our hearts and would you draw us unto yourself? We want to be closer to you. Father, I pray for myself. I pray that your word would be open to me. I pray that my heart would be open to your word. I pray that for all of us. I pray that your spirit would move in this place, that you would grab a hold of our hearts. Father, I cannot hardly keep an ear. I cannot get a hold of anybody's heart, but you can. Your word is sharp. It's quick. It's powerful. It's quick. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. 
Father, your word is the, is the word that divides bone and marrow. Father, pierce our hearts. Speak to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, now check this out. Back in verse 3, it says, And I said to them, Do not let the gates of Jerusalem be opened until the sun is hot, and while they stand guard, let them shut, uh, let them shut and, the bar the, and bar the doors and appoint guards among the inhabitants. Who's the guy speaking? Who's the I? I told them. It's the name of the book. You say it. Nehemiah. This guy, Nehemiah, remember that he had come into Jerusalem to rebuild the wall, right? Is it hot in here? Uh, <laughs> y'all help me out a little. It's Nehemiah. He come back in to build the city, to build the wall around the city. And, it, and he did it in 52 days, right? Yep. 52 days, he's built this entire wall. And in the, if that's not a feat in and of itself, remember that in the middle of that 52 days, in the middle of rebuilding the wall, Nehemiah had found out that there were some people in Jerusalem who were charging so much in, in taxes, so much in tribute, so much in interest, that people were having to borrow money just to buy bread. They didn't even have enough money to borrow, so they were having to sell their own children into slavery, into, into uh, indentured servitude, so that they could even just buy bread. Remember that? Some of you do. Some of you are like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Well, that's what happened. The people were, they didn't have any money. And then the, the rulers and the, and the governors, they were charging the people so much that the, the regular average person was having to sell their children into slavery just so that they could eat. And Nehemiah, about 25 days into this whole journey, just less than a month, Nehemiah had to deal with this. And so Nehemiah goes and talks to all the rulers and all the governors and tells them to stop it. Not only did they repent and stop it and give the money back, but then they actually made Nehemiah their governor. They put him in charge because Nehemiah had demonstrated to everybody that he loved them so much, that he'd come there, that he, had, he was with the king, but he had come to be with them. I think you can probably start to see the typology without me digging too far into that. So Nehemiah had demonstrated that he loved these people, and so they established him as their governor. And then Nehemiah gets all the people, empowers them and inspires them, and all the regular people were working, and they finished the wall in 52 days. And after 52 days, they finished the wall. They hung the doors. Remember that last week? They had hung the doors, and they got them all up on their hinges. That was a big deal. And now Nehemiah says, you guys need to make sure to shut the doors in the evening and keep them shut until the sun is hot the next day. Don't just let anybody in here. And Nehemiah starts to look around now that the city can't be pillaged and people can't just come in and out. They have to come through the gates that are open where the guards are. Now Nehemiah starts to notice something. What's he notice? Look, he says it in verse four. Now the city was large, it's spacious, and the people were in it were few. And the houses were not rebuilt. Now, do you understand that? Nehemiah, finally, they, they get the wall built. That is, that's done. And Nehemiah starts looking around and he realizes the city's it's half empty. Probably more than half empty. It's estimated that 2 million people were taken captive from Babylon. And now we just read at the end of this that there's 42,000 people who were there. That's a big difference. The city's quite empty. And that's a problem. I mean, we need people to, that, that's where industry comes from. That's where businesses come from. That's where taxes are going to get paid by, by having people there. And in the middle of noticing that the city is, there's not that many people there, God puts it on Nehemiah's heart to do something. What's he telling Nehemiah to do? In verse five, then God put it in my heart to gather the nobles and the rulers and the people that they might be registered by genealogy. How's he going to do that? You remember Nehemiah was the king's cupbearer. He had only been here for 52 days. How is Nehemiah going to know who to register and who not to register inside of the city? Well, the Lord does what he always does, and he opened up a door for that. Look what Nehemiah said. He said that he, the Lord put on his heart to register the people by genealogy. And in the middle of that verse 5, he says, And I found a register of the genealogy of those who had come up in the first return and found written in it. So Nehemiah says he found a genealogy. There was a guy named Zerubbabel and there was a guy named Ezra. Ezra is the book of the Bible right before Nehemiah that we're reading. Zerubbabel had brought some people back to Jerusalem. Ezra had brought some people back to Jerusalem. Nehemiah said, I found their register. The people that had been taken captive, had been captive for 70 years and had come back into the city, I found a register of them. So now he has something to compare it to. And so he starts reading through this list of names. Are you sticking with the story? Nehemiah is going through the registry to check who was actually an Israelite and who's not. Does that make sense? Now pay attention. Look at verse 61. And these were the sons who came up from Tel Melah, Tel Harsha, Cherub, Abdon, and, and Emar. But they could not identify their father's house nor their lineage. You get that? There's a group of people. The city's more than half empty. Now Nehemiah is going through the registry, and you know what he finds? 
there's people in the city, there's people living amongst the Israelites who are claiming they're Israelites, but he can't find their name in the registry. I want you to notice there's a need for there to be people there. Could you imagine from Nehemiah's perspective, he's noticing that the city's quite empty for how large it is. It's big and spacious, but there's not a lot of people there. And now he notices that there's people, he goes to register them. God put that on his heart is what Nehemiah said. Nehemiah goes to register these people and he starts to notice that there's people that aren't in the registry. And notice how many there are. With 42,000 people there, look at this. He says they're the sons of, of, uh, they couldn't identify their father, whether they were of Israel. In verse 62, the sons of Deleah, Tobiah, the sons of Nakoda, 642. 600, can you imagine a group of, looking at a group of 642 people and saying, you can't be in here. Not only that, but look at verse 64. Look at it again. These sought their listing among those who were registered by genealogy. Not only are they living there, but it says that they sought it. They wanted to be found. They wanted to be in Israel. They wanted to be in Jerusalem. And Nehemiah has to look at this group of, at, 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 right now we're just talking about the, the lay person. He has to look at a group of six, 642 people and say, you don't, get, you don't get to be here. You don't belong here. You're not in the registry. I want everybody to pay attention. I want you to listen to me real quick. You ready for this? Desire to be a Christian, desire to be in God's kingdom is not enough. I know that's shocking the first time you hear it, but I need you to let it sink in for a second. A desire to say, I want to be a Christian is not enough. There's a guy that I know every year about this time. He's probably doing it right now. Every every year about this time, he decides he wants to lose weight. And so he goes on a diet, he orders some system, he orders some new workout thing, he orders some diet plan, he goes and puts some money into it, and a couple of weeks later, he's right back at it. And he'll tell you that. So one year I said to him, I said, you know, you do this over and over, don't don't you want to be fit? Don't you want to be trimmed? Don't you want to lose the weight? And he said, absolutely. That's why I keep doing this. And I said, then I, I don't understand what the problem is. If you want to do it, why don't you do it? And he said, the problem is I want food more. I'm not talking about you. Some of you are like, is he talking about me? I'm not talking about you. (laughs) Some of y'all know that diet. You know that plan. A desire to have it is not the same thing. I'll tell you a little secret about myself. You can only laugh a little. I really want to play the saxophone. Shut up. <laughs> now listen, I really want to play the saxophone. I, I was at like 13 years old. I'm walking through LaGrange and light up LaGrange. And there's these guys that are outside in a saxophone trio. And that's like what set me. I'm like, I want to do that. One day I'm going to be like out in downtown Louisville with my little case out playing my saxophone. You're like, is that the pastor? Uh, my parents, they, they love me so much. They got together with some other people and they went out and they bought me a very nice saxophone about five years ago. You know where that saxophone is today? <laughs> Sitting in a case in my basement. Kirk was over at my house the other day, and, and he said something about, how often do you play the saxophone? And Jenny chimes in and goes, about five times. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that funny? There's a difference in the desire to want to. Like, I like the saxophone. And don't get confused. I do not, we're not talking about Kenny G, okay? That's, <laughs> I don't mean that. I like, the, I like it. I like the way it sounds. I want to play it. But I don't. Can I show you something? You want, you want to see a verse in the Bible? Sure you do. Look at 2 Timothy. I know you do. I, I can answer for you. It's fine. Look at, look at 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verses 1 through 7. Look at this. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 through 7. You there? Let's get a little more excitement. Just lie to me if you have to. You there? There we go. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. Would you believe we're in the last days? Yes. Do you agree with that? In the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves. Lovers of money, boasters, and proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, and without self-control, brutal, despisers of good. I feel like he's describing right now, don't you? Traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Now, of all that that we just read, that's a pretty nasty description, isn't it? Read this with me. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. That person that we just read about, 
It says they have a form of godliness. What's perceived like it's, like it's a godliness. I mean, it seems like they're desiring God. It seems like they would pursue God. They have a form of godliness, but they deny its power. Read this, from such people turn away. <coughs> Excuse me. For this, sort of, for, for this sort are those who creep into the household and make captive of gullible women loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts. Read verse seven. Always learning. What are they learning? They're just, it says that they, they have a form of godliness, always learning. But you ready for this? Never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. A desire, even a reason. Do you understand that there are some people that could look at our church, that could look at what we have? I think sometimes we start to get spoiled. As a matter of fact, I know we do. This happens for all of us. You know, you get used to something, you get comfortable with it. You know, there are people that come in here and you know what they say? I wish I had that. You know what people have said to me in the past year? I wish I had somebody to support me like, like when, when I lost my spouse, like you had when, every, when everybody was supporting you when you lost your wife. And you're right, I did. I mean, I had a church of people behind me holding me up. You all described yourselves as a group of people holding my arms up when I couldn't hold them up anymore. Do you know how many people would love that? I wonder, do you understand what I'm saying here? How many people, how many people see the city's empty? They see the need. I'm talking about their own lives. How many of you have looked at your own life and you recognize the need? Are you listening to me? A reason to be a Christian is not making you a Christian. A desire to be a Christian, a desire to be in his kingdom is not enough. It needs more than a desire. It goes even further. Look at what happens back in Nehemiah chapter seven and look at verse 63. This gets even deeper. And of the priest, these are priests. Of the priest, the sons of Habia and the sons of Koz and the sons of Barzili, Bar- Barzillai, who took of, of the wife of the daughters of Barzillai and the Giladite and was called by their name. They were called by their name. They're priests. They're called by their name. Look, these sought their listing among those who were registered by genealogy, but it was not found. Therefore, they were excluded from the priesthood as defiled. And the governor said that they should not eat of the most holy things until the priest could consult with the Urim and the Thummim. I got another point for you, and I want you to pay attention. Religion is not enough. You get to this point where you start to go through the steps. There's baptism, or there's the Lord's Supper, like we're going to do later. There's church attendance, there's giving, there's singing songs, there's reading the Bible. Well, friends, I want to tell you something. You can't read the Bible enough to make you saved. I'll come back to that one in a little bit, because I know some of you are like, wait a second. That's right. You can't read the Bible enough to make you saved. You can't give enough to the church to make you saved. You can get baptized a hundred times over. That's not it. You want to look at a scary verse in the Bible? (laughs) No. (laughs) Yes, you do. Look at Matthew chapter 7 and verse 22. Verses 22 and 23. Look at Matthew chapter 7 and verse 22. It was potentially one of the scariest verses in the Bible. It's Matthew 7, 22. You got it? Come on, let's do this together. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Cast out demons in your name? And done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them. Are you ready? They cast out demons in his name. They did wonders in his name. And he says, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. How can that be? Wait a second. Help me out. How can, how can God rightfully look at somebody who cast out demons in his name and say to them, get away from me, depart from me? I need everybody's attention. I need your attention. You've got to pay attention. If this verse has ever scared you, you've got to pay attention to this. The key is not in what they did. It's what they didn't say. If this verse was going to be really scary, you know what it would need to look like? it would need to say that they said, Lord, Lord, did we not believe on your son, Jesus? But that's not what it says, is it? Notice what they're leaning on in that verse. They'll say, Lord, Lord, did we not cast out demons in your name? What are they leaning on? Where's their faith? Well, we cast out demons, didn't we? What are they leaning on? Oh, we did wonders in your name. Let's go from the other side. 
There's a story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. This guy named Philip, he's a disciple of the Lord. And the Lord tells him in the middle of the night, get up and go to the desert. And so Philip gets up to go to the desert. He gets in the desert and there's a caravan. The Lord tells him to run up to the caravan. And so Philip runs up to the caravan and there's an Ethiopian eunuch in the caravan and he's reading from Isaiah. By the way, isn't that interesting? I told you earlier, you can't read enough Bible to make you saved. He was reading from Isaiah. Philip said to the Ethiopian, he said, do you know what you're reading? And what did what the Ethiopian say? How can I, unless somebody explains it to me? So Philip climbs up in the chariot and begins to explain to him the gospel from Isaiah. And the eunuch, they come up on some water and the eunuch says, here's water. What keeps me from being baptized? You better pay attention because I like to do this every now and then. And Philip says, nothing if you cast out demons. Are you with me? He says, nothing if you'll do many works in Jesus' name. Is that what he says? Philip says, he says to Philip, here's water. What keeps me from being baptized? And do you know what the word says? Philip said, nothing if you believe. Jesus is not asking you. Pay attention. He is not asking you to go through a list of do's and don'ts. He is not asking you to do wonders in his name. He has not said, for you to be saved, do many wonders in my name. Speak in tongues and you'll be saved. That's not what he said. Am I knocking on doing good things for the Lord? I'm not, but hear this. You've got it backwards. It'll never be enough. If you want to be in God's kingdom, you better be in the registry. You get that? And there's only one way to get in the registry. Let me tell you a little story that happened here in church. If you go back two or three weeks and you look at the live stream, right now we're live streaming, there's some cameras going. Well, if you go back a couple of weeks ago and you look at the live stream on YouTube or on Facebook, for about eight minutes of the live stream, it's like elevator music. And you see Kirk up here, he's like jumping and like whatever with his bass. And, but it's just elevator. And you see the words at the bottom of the screen, but it's just like elevator music going on. And so later that week, I asked Jameson, I said, Jay, what happened on the live stream this past week? I mean, it was like, it was like elevator music for eight minutes or so. And he goes, yeah, it was a good learning experience. He said, it was the slides. And I was like, the, the slides? How was it the slide? I mean, it was like elevator music happening. What, what, what did that have to do with the slides? He said, well, on the, the live stream, there's two separate slides happening. There's the in-house and then there's the live stream. He said, on those live stream, those slides are connected to other things. So when you're in a slide and you, and you go forward, it tells the, the computer to do certain things like unmute the microphones and turn off the elevator music. And so what happened was they had skipped the first slide, which would have unmuted the house microphones and turned off the elevator music. So the second slide, when they got through it, it tells the cameras to come on. So the cameras come on, and there's words on the bottom of the screen, but all you can, see, all you can hear is just elevator music. Now listen, hey, I'm, stay, stay practical with me for a second. How many people are experiencing this very thing? You're seeing God's people worship. You're seeing God work, but for some reason, you don't feel like you're hearing it. Friends, I'm asking you a serious question. Did you skip the first step? He didn't ask you to cast out demons first. He asked you to believe on him. Paul was, was in Philippi and he got arrested. The Philippian jailer beat him, put him in the deepest part of the prison, probably naked, chained to a wall. Paul and Silas began to sing that night and the chains fell off. Do you remember that story? When the chains fell off, the jailer drove his sword and he wasn't trying to protect himself. He was going to kill himself. Remember that? And Paul called out from the dungeon and he said, oh, don't hurt yourself. We're all accounted for. The jailer sent down for a light and brought out Paul and Silas. And when they came out, the first words out of his mouth were, what must I do to be saved? And what did Paul say? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you and your household will be saved. There is one way to be in the registry. There's one way to be in the family. For these guys in Nehemiah, you can't just come live in the city. You can't come and practice the priesthood. Do you understand? They're, they're sacrificing animals and sprinkling blood on the altar. They're doing the whole thing. But they got it out of order. They're not supposed to be there. Friends, hear this. If you want in God's family, he's made a way for you. He's already prepared it. He's already set it up. And some people have trouble with this. They've, they've tried to reject this. Some people don't like this. I'll show you biblically that some people don't like this. Look at it. Look at Romans chapter 9. <coughs> Look at Romans chapter 9 and verse 30. Romans chapter 9 and verse 30. I'll show you this from the Jews and the Gentiles, but the same thing's happening today. 
Look, Romans 9 and verse 30, we'll read all the way through 33. Nice and loud. Do you have it? It's good. No, it's good. It's fine, guys. I'll be, I'll be down too. It's fine. We'll all be down together. No, we're going to be, <laughs> come on, we can do better than that. I'm going to ask you and you're going to lie to me and say you do have it. Romans 9 and 30. Amen. That's better. What shall we say then? Here's what we're going to say. The Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained righteousness. Even the righteousness of, I want you to say it, even the righteousness of. But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness. Look, they're pursuing it. They're doing it. Israel pursued the law of righteousness, has not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? It's biblical. Why? Because they did not seek it by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at the stumbling stone. As it is written, behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, a rock of offense. Who is that? That's Jesus. And whoever believes on him shall not be put to shame. That flies in the face of what we want to know, what we want to think. What we want to think is this. I know how, how I'll get to God. I'll do these things. And then we come, to, we come to whatever our conclusions are. I'll light candles. I'll rub beads. I'll get baptized. I'll get in church. I'll make myself better. I'll do better. I'll stop drinking. I'll put away the drugs. I'll stop looking at porn, whatever. You put anything else in there. And I'm telling you this, none of that will save you. You'll just be a sober, boring, don't know what to do with yourself person that's still going to hell. <laughs> do you hear what I said? You can be a sober guy going to hell. Jesus did not say put those things first. He said, believe in me. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by me. You want in the kingdom? How do I get in the kingdom? These people sought to have their names in the registry, but they sought it the wrong way. They're trying to be, do priestly things. That's the wrong way. How, do they, how are they supposed to get in? The same way that you and I would get in, by faith in the Lord Jesus. There's one way to the Father. I am the way and the truth and the life. That's what Christ told us. Now, one more thing. I'm just going to close out with this. I love this last part. You get into like all these animals and singers in verse 66. I'm in Nehemiah chapter seven, but then look at verse 70. And some of the heads of the father's houses gave to the work. The governor gave to the treasury 1,000 gold drachmas and 50 basins and 530, 530 priestly garments. That's a, and those garments were not cheap. They had gold laced in there and everything. Some of the heads of the, uh, the father's houses gave to the treasury of the work 2,000 gold drachmas and 2,200 uh, silver minas. And that which the rest of the people gave was 20,000 gold drachmas and 2,000 silver minas and 67 priestly garments. Now hang on, stick with me for a second. Do you remember what I told you earlier when I was going over the history of Nehemiah? Remember about 25 or 26 days in? Do you remember that these were the same people? that were selling each other into, or buying each other in slavery just for, just for their own brother to get bread? Can you imagine, like, here's one Israelite, and he's making another Israelite sell his daughter so that he can give him some bread? That was less than a month ago from where we read. And now, a month later, with Nehemiah, the one who cared about them and showed them that he loved them, with Nehemiah in place. Look, all these people, what are they doing? In less than a month, not only are they not selling each other, now it says that they're taking their own money and they're giving it to the, to the work of the Lord. They're giving it to Jerusalem. Hey, everybody pay attention. Listen, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, because he loves you, that's how it goes. He loves us so much that we want to put our faith in him. God the Father loves you so much that he sent his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. I believe in him because he loves me. He came here, he died for me, he rose for me. And when I put my faith in him, I need you to hear this. He changes my whole life. The change happens after you believe. The change happens after you put your faith in Jesus. And then he begins to produce fruit in your life. And if you have him as the root, if you have him as the vine, then what your life ought to be producing is good fruit. Because he's the one that you're connected to. My life shouldn't look the same as it used to look. Because now I have him. I've heard this illustration before. I can't remember who did it. I can't remember who said it. It's not mine. I heard somebody else say it. If I came into you today, if I came into this building today and I looked at you and I said, sorry, I'm late, guys. I got hit by a Mack truck. I was parked across the street over at the dumpster place and when I was trying to cross, I got, I got smashed by a Mack truck. 
Now, I know you guys love me and you trust me. Would you believe that? Why not? (laughs) Because I'm walking. Because I'm not all beat up, right? I mean, how in the world could I be hit by a Mack truck and then walk in here and look exactly the same? Are you ready for this? How in the world can you have an encounter with a holy God and walk away the same? And walk away the same? You're made different because he's made you different. And he's the one producing fruit in you. And so now it's not that I'm doing good works because I'm trying to reach him. It's I'm doing good works because he loves me so much that he saved me. You get that? It's the first step. Don't miss the first step. It's faith in Jesus Christ. And if you don't have your faith in Jesus Christ, then you're not in him. You're not in the Father and you're not in the kingdom. And I don't care what other steps you've taken. You know what you're doing? You're seeing everybody else worship, but you're not hearing the Lord for yourself. You've got a conscience that's been seared. The Holy Spirit has made it clear to us in his own word that if you want to be in the kingdom, it starts with faith in Jesus Christ. And I'm asking you this question. Have you done that? Do you have your faith in Jesus right now or have you been trusting in your own works? Friends, I don't know where you are today, but I'm going to ask everybody to stand up on your feet. Even right now, let's all stand up. And if you need to make a decision for the Lord, this is your chance to do it. We're going to take the Lord's Supper. Do not let that distract you. We can take care of the Lord's Supper after the fact. If you need to make a decision, you do that even right now while they're playing this song. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for who you are. Thank you for how great you are. And thank you, Lord, that you prepared a way for us to be able to come to you. Father, we are in awe of how much you love us and how much you have shown that through your son. So for just a moment, we want to be in awe of you and say thank you. Thank you for preparing us and taking care of us. Father, I pray that right now, if there's somebody in here, if there's somebody watching online that has never trusted you as their savior. Father, maybe there's somebody who's been going through the motions, but they've never by faith trusted your son. Lord, would you reveal that to them? Father, I pray that if there's anyone that needs to make a decision for you, I pray that you'd put it on their heart to do so even right now. God, we love you and we thank you that we get to be a part of your kingdom. And we thank you that that's through your son, Jesus, that you've not required our own lives for what we've done. We know the wages of sin is death and we're so thankful that you were willing to give your son to take care of that. So, Lord, just take this invitation. Do with it whatever you want. We're yours. We give ourselves to you. We say, Lord, your will. In Jesus' name, amen.